Okay, we're talking about the 19th century, a time of revolution, and we're talking about the approach of Protestants intellectually. We just did that in the last video. How does Protestants react to the rise of secular humanism, the nationalism, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution? So how did Catholics respond to this? Okay, that's the subject of this, video number 43. We're going to finish out with this video, um, out the outline of week 6, okay? 6B. So, let's talk about the Pope. When we say the Pope, we're talking about the longest reigning Pope in the history of the Catholic Church. Pope Pius IX, Pio Nono. He was Pope from 1846 all the way to 1878. Uh, he beats out John Paul II, even, for the longest reigning Pope. He's really the creator of the modern papacy. Remember, historical consciousness. The past is not like the present, exactly. We shouldn't as assume it is. So, the modern papacy, what do we mean by that? Pope Pius IX was a, a big figure, a strong figure. He was a prominent figure who um, exercised great influence. He had quite a stature, but he wrote, and he wrote a lot. And prior to him, we're used to popes cutting a big figure on the world stage, but honestly, prior to Pius the, the IX, Pio IX, they really, the popes didn't write a lot. Uh, we have very little from the, the popes on the previous hundred years in terms of encyclicals, for example. Okay, very, very little. So he begins the, uh, the, the great literary output of a pope that's writing a lot and is, is engaging the modern world, engaging pastoral problems with a lot and giving a lot of direction. That's a new thing with Pio Nono. And one thing I need to tell you about, he becomes Pope 1846 and people kind of thought of him as a rather progressive figure, open-minded, rather liberal figure. They were pretty excited, um, uh, many, when they saw him come to the throne of Peter during this time of revolution and tumult in Europe. So, in 1848, remember I told you that the Papal States lay right in the middle of Italy, uh, really um, in the way of Italian unification, Italian nationalism. And so, um, poor Pius saw, after two years, he saw his Prime Minister, Pellegrino Rossi, assassinated in the streets of Rome. And the Holy Father himself had to don a disguise to escape from the city and go into exile. He took refuge down in the direction of Naples in a, in a town called Gaeta on the seacoast. And he had to stay there for a while. So he was run out of his own city of Rome by violent people who wanted to kill him. That does something to you. Uh, would you agree? So the Pope now is no longer so open to the modern world and to the new ideas and the new movements that are out there. He sees the danger of them. And he becomes a, very, uh, a man who's very critical of what's developing as the modern world in the 19th century. Now, he gets into a very defensive posture, but I, I just have to, in, in fairness to poor old Pius IX, let's look at what kind of blows the church has suffered, the Catholic church, in the last few hundred years, okay? First of all, we got the 16th century Reformation. Boom. We got the loss of England. We got the loss of Northern Germany, the loss of Scandinavia. You know, that's a pretty big deal. We got the Enlightenment, 17th, 18th century, and the attack on revealed religion. We got the 19th century. We got atheism attacking the church. We have the French Revolution seizing lands. We got Italian and German national government seizing lands. Like, you know, Henry VIII started that, and it just kept going. Lands, uh, properties, monasteries, schools. I mean, the church is getting boom, boom, boom. It's getting hit all over the place, clergy being killed, uh, guillotined in France. Um, so this is a, a really a horrible series of blows for hundreds of years. So really, uh, there's an undermining of church, papal authority. There's an undermining of scripture. There's an undermining of revelation. There's a lot of things going on here. So Pius issues a condemnation. He, uh, there's a lot of different things he writes. And many of them are critical of these forces in the modern world that he sees as being uh, antithetical to faith and morals. So he calls uh, uh, one document that takes excerpts and critiques from a lot of his writings 
of the modern world, and it's called the Syllabus of Errors, 1864. Now, if you read the Syllabus of Errors, you can say the Pope is right about a lot of these errors. But the problem is this kind of typifies the way people see him as someone who is just scowling at everything having to do with the modern world. So he becomes kind of pigeonholed as being very negative, okay? And always saying thou shalt not, and always saying this is wrong. So that's the posture that he get, kind of gets himself in is denunciation and resisting the errors of the age. Um, you know, there are errors that need to be announced and resisted, but this is, he gets into this, as, he see, he's seen and perceived, and the church is seen and perceived as being retrograde and being resistant to anything modern or new. Uh, and this is described as uh, the fortress mentality. The Holy Mother Church needs to circle the wagons and, and fight off the attacks. Um, and so that, you'll hear a lot of talk about this fortress mentality, but there's some, a good deal of truth to this mentality of having to fight off the attacks of the modern world. Okay? You'll also hear it spoken of as triumphalism. Triumphalism is all the problems the church is having are due to its enemies. Uh, we don't bear any responsibility for it. Everyone else is wrong, 100%. And the church will triumph in the end. The church will triumph gloriously over all its foes. Now, you can see that that kind of attitude uh, taken, for example, now by bishops in the face of the pedophilia crisis, no one would buy that. And that kind of a posture would be uh, very destructive. And actually, some bishops kind of took that approach. I know of one particular, and it backfired and caused tremendous amount of loss, uh, much bigger settlement against the church than if the, church, the, the bishop had admitted the wrongdoing and the, 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 the mistakes uh, that were made back in the 80s. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm making the point that triumphalism is an attitude. It, it basically, it, it, we're all right, they're all wrong, and we will gloriously triumph. And we identify our cause. I mean, the individual members of the hierarchy and the laity with the cause of God. That's triumphalism, okay? So anyway, this is a mentality that you just kind of find among some Catholics during this period. This is accused, people accused Pius IX of exhibiting this kind of mentality. Now, theologically speaking, this is a mindset, and you have to understand this kind of mindset or this posture in order to understand what the Council, the Second Vatican Council and the First Vatican Council were trying to do. The First Vatican Council is a doctrinal council convened to, to respond to these errors. First, nationalism is asserting the state as supreme, uh, the king and the new prime ministers as supreme in authority. That's why they're seizing schools, because they want to control the formation of people, not the church, okay? So the Pope believed that the assertion of papal primacy and the reassertion of papal authority and the enhancing of papal authority authority was an important corrective to this. And so one of the things the Vatican I did was it defined papal infallibility. And it, it defined a very narrow papal infallibility. There were some people against any definition of papal infallibility, and there's others that wanted to define the Pope as being infallible in everything he ever said. So what really came out of the council was a definition that the Pope speaking ex cathedra, which just means in his official capacity as successor of Peter, from the chair of Peter, speaking with the fullness of his authority. He could engage that authority to define dogma. Okay? Now, honestly, that's only happened twice in the last 2,000 years. So it's not a big deal. But it, it's still uh, focusing on the institution of the papacy, clarifying the authority of Peter. It also talks about his universal jurisdiction, the, 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 that the Pope has universal jurisdiction, okay? And uh, this, how, does, how do people take this? Well, you have to understand that there were many Catholics, uh, including bishops and priests, who were not excited about this. And so after Vatican I, there is a, a, a flow of many people from Germany, for example, into the arms of the old Catholics. So you remember those old Catholics, a schismatic group? They're, they have valid bishops and they have valid sacraments, um, but, and they've been around since Jansenism. Well, now they're swelled by people who are against papal infallibility, thinking that's an addition to the ancient 
old Catholic doctrine. Um, had people ever talked about papal infallibility? Yes, of course. It's been a theological opinion. It's been theologically debated, but it's never been defined as dogma that you must accept. So that is now a Catholic dogma and uh, many people refuse to accept it. So you have to just keep in mind after every council, this fallout. Every council may settle a question, but it, it leaves some people very unsettled and some people don't accept it and leave. Okay, so the, the fallout after Vatican II is no different than the fallout after Nicaea uh, or the fallout after Vatican I. Something else the Vatican I did that's important, and that is that it has a constitution on divine revelation. It teaches, first of all, that the Enlightenment's right in some respects, okay? It's possible through human reason to prove the existence of God. There's always been proofs of the existence of God in the Catholic tradition, Anselm, Aquinas. So none of them are canonized. The Pope doesn't say this is the perfect proof. He just says it is possible from reason to know the existence of God with certainty. Now, it doesn't mean you know a lot about God, but it, that you can reason from uh, the world or reason from the human person. You can reason with, and find and discover without grace, um, without revelation, you can discover the reality of God as creator, okay? Um, that's a very important affirmation. That is, God, that is um, doctrine for Catholics, okay? That it can be proved. Um, just keep in mind, common sense can and should discover the existence of God, but common sense isn't very common, especially with a weakened intellect, a darkened intellect through, from sin. You know, sin in our lives causes us not to see things very objectively. We got a culture, the world, Paul calls the, the, the alien culture, the anti-Christian culture we live in, the world. But we have that pumping through radio waves, TV, print, you know, a, a mentality that, that uh, obscures the reality of God. It's not just God that we can figure out. We can figure out a lot of the truths of the Ten Commandments, the moral law from reason. You know, the Enlightenment thinkers thought that, and it, the, the, second, the First Vatican Council would agree with that, okay? But it also defines the need for revelation that in fact God does reveal himself. And so there's a beginning of, of some beautiful development on revelation. Now, we're not going to go, uh, it, so it has to reassert revealed truth. So here we see a balance, you know, we see reason and revelation, not reason or revelation. And God, as is as, as truly in the face of atheism, is truly provable by reason and truly revealed to us in fullness in Christ. So, you know, the, the council is trying to assert these things uh, against the backdrop of this age. But this age ends the council prematurely because part of this age is warfare and nationalism. And the, the only reason why the Italian armies uh, in the north and in the south haven't taken the Papal States is because there are French troops helping the Pope. The Pope's uh, Swiss Guard are not enough to keep away Italian armies from the north and the south who are closing in on the Papal States. So the French armies in 1870 are recalled to France because they're now a war between Prussia and France. So with the French armies leaving, everyone knows the papal sites are just, a, it's a matter of days before they're taken. So the Council Vatican I is never officially ended. It just is cut short and uh, the, the bishops take off. And now the Rome is taken. The papal states are taken. The Pope becomes a prisoner of Vatican City. And at that moment, he's not, he doesn't go willingly. Pope Pius IX is, in a certain way, um, at, at odds with the Italian government until the 1920s. Uh, and there's a concordat where Italy recognizes the, papal, uh, the, the Vatican City, the independence of the Pope. The Pope recognizes the state of Italy. But things are very tense for Pio Nono, and he has eight more years left as a prisoner inside of the Vatican. So what's going on, um, what's going on here in terms of um, theology? Theology at this point in this period of the 19th century is rather impoverished. There have been manuals around, 
manuals of theology that serve in the seminaries. They're very abstract. They're very scholastic or neo-scholastic. Um, they, they don't have the life-giving creativity of St. Thomas or the passion of St. Bonaventure. They're rather dry. The recovery of Thomas is not the greatest recovery. Uh, in the Enlightenment, it gets shot through. The commentators on St. Thomas are kind of rationalistic. You know, everybody is influenced by the Enlightenment. Okay, so Protestants are influenced by it and Catholics are influenced by it. So theology and the view of Thomas becomes very rationalistic. Uh, they make Thomas into a very pat sort of a guy who ABC lays it all out, no questions. This is not really very good. So we call this, it, it, theology is just reasoning from, it, you have premises, you reason from the premises to conclusions. It's very deductive and it's, it's, it's very dull and it's very uncreative and very dry. We call this conclusion theology. So it's kind of an impoverished neo-scholasticism that doesn't have a lot of power to engage the culture, to energize the Catholic community, all right? So this is where we are when Pio Nono passes away after a long reign. He's the very first pope to exercise a regular universal teaching ministry. Um, and so 37 encyclicals in 32 years. His predecessor, nine short encyclicals in 15 years. So this 32 year reign comes to an end in, 19, in 1878 and a new era is about to begin in the Catholic Church and uh, in a few decades, a new era in Western civilization. Thank you.